Hello, everyone. I would love to welcome you today on the behalf of our methodological center. Uh, we are happy to uh, announce and introduce Håkan Andersson from Sweden. He's a world-class spring coach. Uh, tremendous amount of experience, real-world experience, also developing uh, talent in uh, north of Europe. As we know, it, that there's not big a talent pool, but even in that scenario, Håkan managed to create world-class athletes. Uh, so uh, today, Håkan will talk about uh, speed development, particularly linear speed development in basketball, uh, provide some of his thoughts about uh, the speed development, uh, plyometrics, and uh, strength training. So please uh, welcome uh, Håkan Andersson. Pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Mlad. <laughs> First of all, I uh, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to come here to, to your beautiful country and your amazing establishment. I, I've been to, to various uh, sites in the world and for, for a single sport, I don't think I've seen, seen many to, to match this. You know, you have a great facility and an opportunity to meet some really great people too. You know, we had, uh, have been there since, since Tuesday and we, you know, had, uh, we had the opportunity to have good coffees and, uh, and a lot of good, good talks. So, as Mladen said, my name is Hakan Andersen, and I've been uh, involved in track and field athletics for more than 50 years, uh, as a coach for almost 40 years. And uh, I'm married to a Canadian woman, you know, as most women, they're not so impressed about their men, you know, when she has a bad day, she says, oh, you're the most boring man in the world. Huh? You got one, one interested in life, I'm fed up with you. And I say, that's not true, I have two interests, 100 and 200 meters. Huh? So, stop complaining. So, that's what I've been doing for a long time. Uh, currently employed by something called the High Performance Center in Växjö. Uh, it's at an establishment like this, but we support uh, a lot of different uh, sports, uh, mainly in uh, ice hockey, in, in handball, football, and other team sports, but also a lot of individual athletes. You know, if everything from leading a daily training to to support uh, in terms of testing and so on. And I have like a senior uh, advising position that I, I, I advise uh, coaches, you know, in strength and, and speed related matters. And also uh, responsible for the testing facilities, you know, both when it comes to, to strength, jumping, sprinting, and also or endurance stuff. And we also do a lot of field testing, uh, especially around in, 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 the, in the southern, southern Sweden. Uh, the topic of today, you know, is uh, going to talk a little about my view on sprinting in, in basketball. I'm, I'm an outsider, you know, I don't, haven't really coached, uh, you know, in any teams, but I have a, a, a son-in-law that is a professional, happens to be a professional basketball player, you know, he, uh, he's currently playing in Sweden. Last year he was in San Sebastian, he's played in, in Estonia, he's played in France, he's played in Italy. He played just about everywhere, and it's been interesting to talk about him, you know, with him, in regardless of, of you know the preparation of basketball players, professional basketball players in various parts of the world. There's a lot of similarities, of course, but there's also some differences, you know, cultural differences, how to prepare prepare athletes in, in, in different sports. Uh, going to talk a little bit about heavy resistance training, my view of, of the ben benefits and my, some problems with, with the heavy resistance training in terms of developing speed. And uh, also about, you know, playing metrics and, and uh, resistance sprinting. I had a picture on the side about, you know, it says the good, bad and ugly. When it comes to heavy resistance training, plyometric and, and, and so on, people have always have, have opinions. Some people say it's beautiful, it's great. Some ability I wouldn't touch, uh, you know, I would not let my, my athlete jump, I would not let them lift heavy weights and so on. So it's a bit of a confusion and sometimes too hard to, hard to dis discuss the top topic because you have so many different, different uh, views and angles how to at attack the issues. So. Uh, like Mladen say, I come from the northern part of Europe, not too far away from the polar circle. 21st of June, we have daylight 24 hours. 21st of December, there is complete darkness. <laughs> so it might not be the best place on earth to, to, to produce sprinters, but uh, you, know, you have what you have. I always say you have to, you know, you have the, you got to make best out of the opportunities and the facilities have. 
if you consider the bother about the climate or your, your training facilities, no, you're not going to go anywhere, you know. So when you come in, you know, to our, our training culture, if you're a complainer, there is a door, huh? So you bring in positive energy, and you're going to get any positive energy in return. And it's amazing what you can do with limited resources. I mean, from the resources we have, we have sent so many athletes to Olympic Games, World Ch Championships, and so on, been taking medals in Europeans. So sometimes you, you have this idea that, oh, it's impossible for us because we are so you know, limited when it comes to talent or you know, the climate and so on. You know. But uh, as uh, Captain Jack Sparrow said, the problem is not the problem. The problem is your attitude about the problem. And it's, uh, I think that uh, is a very wise, wise uh, statement. Uh, I'm really careful for the opportunity to have worked uh, and coached in various team sports. Uh, you know, like most track and field coaches, we are prostituting ourselves in team sports. <laughs> the, we, you know, mainly football is a big sport, of course, in, in Scandinavia. I've been doing some con consultant job even in, in Great Britain. Ice hockey has been a big thing. It's a very big sport in Sweden, especially on a professional level. Handball is a strong sport. Uh, and as I said, the, the contact I had with basketball is through my, my, my uh, you know, son-in-law that I usually help uh, in the summer months. Uh, I'm working extensively with swimmers. Uh, lady there is Anna Karen Kammerling. She has, uh, more, I think, about 40 international medals. Uh, I think she broke eight world records. Uh, you know, specialized in the 50 meter butterfly. Swimming is very different from, from uh, track and field sprinting, but there's still some similarities, you know, when it comes to prepare, land training, you know. Uh, had opportunity to help a guy, you know, Otto Wallin, heavyweight boxer. He's probably the best heavyweight boxer in the, uh, out of Europe in the moment. He, one of the best out of U Europe in the moment. He, he went uh, 12 rounds with Tyson Fury just before the pandemic hit. And he almost won on technical knockout, you know, but uh, the referee wouldn't stop. But he went 12 rounds and he did a fantastic job. But fortunately for his career, the pandemic hit, so it was hard to, to, to get, uh, get fights. But now he's, he's back in business again. And, and uh, yeah, he looks, looks uh, promising. I work with, uh, you know, uh, at this with, uh, you know, with disabilities, uh, you know, I helped to write a book about wheelchair training. Uh, that uh, was also a good time. Uh, learned a lot. But because, you know, the reason I'm here today, uh, and the reason I had the chance to work in other sports is all to these guys. You know, in 40 years I coach hundreds of track and field athletes. Not everyone's successful, but a lot of them were. And when I was a young athlete, you know, I was just about 30 years old, this guy after the left, Turbin Eriksson, he went to, uh, he went to the Olympics and, and placed, uh, you know, came in the semi-final, which was a big success for him, only being 22 years old. Later on, he, he took a medal in the Europeans, and, uh, you know, I was responsible for the Swedish uh, you know, relay program for many years. You know, we went, we were in many, many finals in world championships, uh, in, in the Olympics, we played fifth and so on. Had an opportunity to work with, with a guy called Johan Wismans for a couple of years. He was in the final in the Olympics and in the world championships, around 44.5 in the 400 meter. Very dedicated and, and, and nice athlete. And I know about, not, don't know about you, you know, but some athletes I, you know, I coached for a long, long time. Well, this guy here, Stefan, he's a six-time national champion. I was his coach for 16 years. Huh? That's quite amazing. You know, 16 years, 20 hours a week for 16 years. Huh? I know this guy better than I know my own son. <laughs> so it's sad in a way, you know, but uh, that's how it is. You, got, you become very, you know, you get strong, develop strong relationships after spending so much time together. And, and sometimes I'm, I'm really proud to follow them, you know, post athletics, you know, and they call, you know, now, and, but they, they want other advice than, you know, sprinting now. It's more about family life and career and so on. And, but they always, even if you've been apart for 20 years, I'm still a coach. Huh? Hello, coach. <laughs> So I, I, I've been very, very fortunate to, to, to work in athletic for such a long time. This was also uh, quite amazing. Peter Carlson is a current national record holder in 100 meters in Sweden. 
that caught a couple of, for a couple of years. He was the first Scandinavian to run 910 seconds, run 980 in 1996. A little bit windy, but he was one, one meter behind Donovan Bailey that became Olympic champion just a few weeks later. Also had the opportunity to, to work with some great uh, researchers. Uh, Carmelo Bosco was a guy that I uh, appreciate a lot, Italian physiologist and biomechanist. You probably all heard, done or heard about the counter movement jump and the rebound jump and the squat jumps. He's the father behind that. And him and the Pavokome, Heckinen and the group did a lot of pioneer research about strength shortening cycle in, in the 80s in Finland. So he was a very dynamic, interesting man. And, and uh, unfortunately, they died way too early. Man. And he had this famous quote that I really like too, you know, that, that uh, Italian astronomer and physicist and engineer Galileo Galilei said that measure what can be measured and make measurable what cannot be measured. So I'm quite obsessed with measuring things. I'm not a real testing guy. Yeah? I don't do, at least in track and field, I don't do so much, uh, you know, periodicized testing, but we measure almost every day. Yeah? So if we do sprinting, you know, I, we, we measure electronically. It's not a guesswork, you know. So, so I really enjoy that. And I think uh, Carmen Le Bosco was one of the ones that uh, uh, really, you know, you know, really introduced me to, to that world. And we're doing some, some uh, I'm also interested in sprint research and, and other research, and I've been contributing to, to some works. And, and when, it's one thing that, uh, that always strikes your mind when it comes to sport research, you know, that, uh, you know, we always have, you have the, the belly curve you know, with the non-performers and the average performers, and you have the home Olympics, you know, the athletes that go to the Olympic Games every four years, huh? There are 10,000 people out of, I don't know how many billion people are in the world now. They're very, very extreme people that go to Olympic Games. But we study average performers. And we think it's going to be a transfer, you know, of knowledge into a, to elite performers. It's not always the case, you know. So you have to read science with very crit critical eyes, you know, I think I find. And it's, you know, if you read a, you know, a good paper, next week is going to paper out as contradicted, you know. And and I, we talk about it all the time, you know. It's, uh, it's I think it should be... I think you can be inspired by science, but, but you don't think you should not let, uh, you know, science, uh, uh, you know, affect you too much. What I see in the sporting world is usually the coaches that leads the development. They come up with new ideas, creative training, and it's the scientists that, you know, eventually come up with, with proofs that it, it, it does work. And you always have this uh, problem too, you know, most coaches are interested in training studies. Huh? And you, 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 if you do a training intervention, it's usually one great stimuli. So you do a great stimuli, you know, you do heavy squatting for, for 16 weeks, and you, you have a pretty decent result. So you say, oh, heavy squatting is good for sprinting, when you isolate it. But the problem in the sporting world, especially in a team sport like you, you bombard, you know, the you know the athletes with different stimuli into a black box that we don't really know, know what's, what was go, what's going on in there, and out come a result. And a sprinter is usually happy if he can improve two or three hundredths of a second in a year. It's a great success. But what stimuli or what combination of stimuli or the series of events, you know, and and everything that is around the training too, you know, the, your social life, you know, the you know, everything affects the outcome. So sometimes you have to, you have to take uh, results from training studies with a grain of salt. It's, uh, the ultimate training studies are bed rest studies. Huh? When people have bed rest for a month and they do you know, maybe a leg extension for a month, and then you exclude everything, you know. You, they say, so, and you can't regulate that like that. Maybe you're trying your best, but you don't know what they're doing at night. They run into clubs and drinking. <laughs> you never know. Uh, also had the opportunity to get to know a lot of fantastic coaches around the world. On the top right is a coach maybe you heard about. You know, he's a 
Dutch Renaissance man, Henk Reinhoff, you know, he says that his famous quote is, train as little as needed to develop and win, and not as much as possible. Huh? It's pretty interesting, you know, because most of us are always willing to, to, see, to try to see how much can we train before they break down. Huh? That's usually the, you know, or they're stale or really overtrained, you know. I never heard anyone that tries to undertrain the athletes, huh? except maybe Henk. Henk has a library that's bigger than Tour Vergata in Italy at home. He knows everything, huh? but his training is very simple. <laughs> So he, he has really found, you know, the, the key performance, uh, you know, exercise, what is really important for, for our development, at least on, on elite level. On the other side, you have uh, probably my best friend in athletics, Leif Ulla Wallnes, he's a Norwegian coach. I don't know if you heard about him. You probably heard about his athlete, Karsten Warholm. Karsten Warholm, you know, if someone would have said 10 years ago that Norwegian would break the world record and win the Olympic Games and two executive world championships here for him to hurt, people would have laughed. Huh? Here come this guy, you know, from the northern Scandinavia and be beats a, a, a world record that every th everyone thought was, you know, drug affected from the 80s huh? with almost a second. He brings the sport to a totally new, new level. And Leif Ola, you know, my friend, he's always been very successful with athletes that can tolerate a great workload. Karsten was a decathlete up till he was 20 years old, multidisciplined. And he can tolerate a lot of training, so he trained a lot. So Leif, uh, Leif Ola said he trained maybe six hours a day Nelly, and broke world record. Nelly Kuman that trained with, with Henk Reinhoff maybe trained 90 minutes a day, broke a world record. So it's very much dependent what athlete you have. And this is a huge challenge in team sports. Because like, like in athletics, you know, we have the sprinters, we have the jumpers, we have the throwers, we have, you know, we have the, you know, long distance runners. And so do you have in a basketball team, you know. And to, to prepare physical training for them, it's, it's, it's very di difficult. It usually can, you know, it can fit some, but it's very hard for it to fit everyone. So that's a big challenge. Also been in Jamaica a couple of times, you know, Stephen Francis, probably one of the most uh, successful coaches in the, in the history of track and field. His, his training group has produced more than 90 medals in the World Olympic, uh, you know, uh, Olympic Games, uh, over 90 in one training group. So. And when I was there, he, he has a stable of about 70 to 80 very talented sprinters and hurdlers. This little island of 4 million people that produce top-class sprinters and hurdlers all the time. Uh. And, but he, him alone is responsible for 70 athletes. So 70 athletes is very difficult to give technical instructions. Huh? It's almost impossible. All he, you heard him screaming is, relax, relax, he screams. But his advantage is he has top performers that can work as models. Huh? So he tells the young athletes, look at Shelian how she moves. Huh? Look at Allah Safa Powell, how we, the first couple of steps. Huh? And I think a lot of times, we, you know, we learn a lot just by watching. Tech, you know, instruction from a coach is not as effective as, as showing something how we're supposed to look. And sometimes, you know, I get fed up, you know, we film at this all, you know, all the time and we try to find faults. You know, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong, rather than showing how it's supposed to look. Huh? So it's usually better to show them a film of how it's supposed to look. And nowadays with YouTube, you can get films just about anything, you know. So this, that's something uh, that I really picked up. I'm really, really, this is just few of the coaches I, I, I got to know, and, and I learned a lot, you know, from, from integrating with them in these years. And, and I really learned that the same suit doesn't fit everyone. I, I, you know, no training system is the best for every, everyone, and, and no coach. I'm not the best coach for, for everyone. I know that, you know, by experience. So you have to have, you're spending so much time together, you know, that I feel you not, that at least in athletics, you need to have a good relationship with athletes as well. So they can tell you, you can give you feedback of how they feel, you know, and stuff. It's very, very important, I find, for, for maximum development. You know, I'm not a dogmatic coach that's screaming at people what to do, you know. I want reason with them. I, you know, I want to explain, I want to feedback, you know, how do you feel, you know. 
how do you feel when you come to training, you know? Do you have problem economy, you know, things like that? You know, I got to know the attitude, you know, for, to be a good coach. And that's uh, not for everyone. I had opportunity to train two monogamous twins, the identical twins. Huh? The one is born 20, meter, uh, 20, me, 20 minutes before midnight, but the other one 20 minutes after midnight. So they're identically twins, but they're born on separate days. Huh? Uh, the one that is born 20, me, uh, 20 minutes before midnight, he's two centimeters taller, he's usually two kilo heavier, and he's oh, winning 95% of the time. Huh? And you know, they, they share the exact same genes, huh? exact same genes. They grew up in the same family, same friends, same school, same coaches, same training, they were doing everything together, but one is always a little bit better than the other. Huh? And I think it has a lot to do with the hair. Huh? You know, the, the oldest one is, little, you know, he's the alpha male of those two. He's the leader, he takes command. Huh? When you try to talk to them, you know, both, you know, he shoves his brother away and he does the talking. Huh? But this, you know, the other guy, William here, when his father, when his brother is absent for his injury or something, he always flourishes. Huh? Both as a human and, and as an athlete. He's much better when <laughs> his brother is not there. They're good friends. They spend all the time together, you know, but it's uh, not very harmonic. So I'm trying to, to separate them now. I think it's about time, the 22, to, de to, to train in different venues. It's going to be good for both of them, I, I think. Uh, what about sprinting in, in ba basketball? I said that... Uh, I'm not very experienced uh, sprint coach, so my ideas are going to be pretty subjective. You know, maybe we can have a discussion about it and see how you feel about it too. Huh? If you talk about components of, of speed, speed in basketball, do you have any, any ideas? What kind of speed do you see? Sprinting do you see in basketball? Anyone that dares to, to challenge me? Something, huh? Change of direction. Change of direction is one. Constant change of direction. Yeah, lots of them, huh? Sorry? Lots of that, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. What else, huh? Acceleration. Accelerations, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Acceleration. Yeah, yeah. Decision making. Decisions making, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably one of the key factors, huh? To read the game, read your opponent, read your you're in your fellow players, you know, to know where to move. So you're run, running the way, no? You see a lot of people that, you know, that you, you know, like a like person like Messi, huh? He doesn't, in, in football, he's not super fast, but he knows where to move. Huh? So, to yeah, 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 yeah. And you probably have those guys in basketball too. Huh? They're doing layups, they, they, you know, they, they can see what foot is the opponent standing on, so I go there. Huh? So I, I see, like you said, reacting to the game and decision making is probably you know, a real key factor. And we always said acceleration with and without ball, deceleration and change of direction with and without ball. It's both with the ball and without the ball. Sometimes the ball is a restriction and force because you've got to control that. Speed endurance, very, very complicated matter, but it probably has some part of it. Maybe, I don't know, maybe more in male and female sport, uh, basketball, I don't know. Seems that male basketball is a bit more intense than the, if, am I correct or am I wrong? Yeah. Maybe it's going to develop, I don't know. It's, uh, what about max and velocity? I don't see uh, any, any of that, you know. I don't see anyone running 100%. If you're watching game after game after game, you see, don't see any sprint, real sprint. 100% effort sprints, but you see sub-maximum. Maybe she see maximum very short accelerations, but not up to maximum velocity, because like we tested a lot of players here yesterday, and you see they reach maximum velocity if they sprint as hard as they can go between 25 to 35 meters. Huh? So that's uh, probably not, it doesn't mean it's, it's not a good quality. Huh? Uh, what about uh, basketball practice huh? in the in the game and in practice? I think you get a lot of this reacting to the game and decision making. Huh? That's uh, that's a lot of that in the game. So, if something you know, when it comes to strength and conditioning and physical training, 
I, my philosophy, if you're getting that stimuli in the game, it's no use breaking it out. Huh? It's better to do it in the game. We only want to break things out that, if, that we can't get enough of it in the game. You know, we want to overload to get you know, super compensation and, and get better. Huh? So we get a lot of accelerations, decelerations, change of directions, speed endurance. We don't see a lot of maximum velocity. But for me, maximum velocity is also highly neural. So even if you're, you're not going to, going to it's, a, it's, a, it's like people say, oh, you don't need maximum velocity, you know, because we, we don't run maximum velocity. It's like, say, because we don't do that on court. But we don't see anyone lifting a barbell on the court either. Huh? You know, it's, you know, it's lifting, uh, you know, sprinting maximum is, is can be very neural. You can still benefit from it, you know, in, in your sport. It can, it can lift these abilities too. Huh? Something, same thing I see in a lot of teams, sport, sport where people don't focus much on our mechanics. Huh? I see a lot of people moving not very healthy, you know, in, in, in a lot of team sports. Huh? Because they're never taught. Huh? If, if, uh, if you, most sports, if they do sprint drills, they, they, they tell them to run over cones or they, they tell, tell them to do you know, certain movements or change of direction, but really all that is taught how to move. We do the runs, you know, we change directions, but we, are, we, never, we rarely teach them how to run. If you, if you, if you go into track and field, I, I don't want to, say that we are the best and everything, but you will, will not find a track and field at this. I don't know, conscious every day about the technique. Just like you are very conscious about your shooting technique. They're very conscious. They, every day, they, for their whole career, they work on technique. And, and basketball or, is a moving sport. Huh? And uh, I think, uh, think uh, especially in the younger years, in an uh, academia, in, in an academy like this, I think it's a good idea to to emphasize on the movement. I, I think that more effective sprinting mechanics will increase maximum or sub-maximum sprinting. You can either, to, to run fast, you can either improve your mechanics, your technique, or you can move your strength, or a combination of the both. Huh? Uh, we'll probably make it a more healthy athlete if you move, move uh, mechanically sound. At, but you always have to be conscious that if you learn how to move better outside the, the court, not necessarily going to be a better player inside, not necessarily. Maybe it can help, you know, but uh, it's uh, it, uh, not always the case. You've got to be humble and, and uh, understand that. I think that even though there's a lot of change of direction, there's a lot of start and stop in basketball. I think linear sprinting is a basic quality. Huh? It's like learning how to walk for a child to learn how to walk. If you cannot r run in a straight line with, with proper mechanics, you're going you're gonna to be even more messier when you change the direction. So I think uh, it's a basic quality that everyone needs to train. The humans, we are. We are we are amazing, you know. That uh, you know, we, we, you know, for a human to to grow it takes almost twenty years, huh? almost twenty years until we are we are we are, we are complete. Huh? And we, you know, in the animal kingdom, we are the the one that can can can, can learn the, you know, the most difficult trades. Huh? You know, we can learn to play the play the violin, and we can run, learn how to you know, run 12 meters per second in a, in a sprint, and we can do so many different things, you know, including playing basketball. And I'm just saying that if you want to become a good basketball player, I think playing basketball is probably 90% of what is important. But it's the last 10% is also important. It might be the difference between being elite and super elite, huh? physical qualities. If you look in the, in America and the NBA, you know, the physical qualities of some of the places is unreal. There are, you know, physical freaks in a lot of them, including some of the Europeans that go, go over and improve their physique by, you know, being, being uh, you know, in, in, in the United States. So. When it comes to sprinting then, that we know that effective sprinting has to, to do with producing, you know, great force in an effective direction in a very, very short period of time. Huh? That's, uh, that's the essence of, of it all. Huh? 
But it's also in the stand, important to understand, understand why an athlete moves in a certain way. If you take the example of this Australian girl at the left and the, one of the greatest sprinters of all time, Carl Lewis, you see there is apparently some issues here to be addressed. Can you see a few? You can see that she's collapsing her ankle, she's collapsing her knee, her hip is collapsing, and the top, and she's leaning the top order. This is not a good position, you know, position to sprint effectively. And you can tell her that, oh, girl, you have to run like Carl. Look at him, you know, his posture. Run like him. Lift the knee like him. You know, be you know further up on the on the, on the be more you know in a more plantar flex position when you sprint. But maybe she doesn't have the strength. Huh? So maybe the strength has to be addressed outside the running track, in the gym, or we apply metrics, or mobility, or there may, might be, be other restrictions that we even know about it. So we have to understand why she runs like that before we, we address it. And like technical instruction can be, like I said, often very ineffective, you know, if you don't if there are deficits in, in, in strength, quality, joint mobility, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, strength can, can manipulate in the gym, might facilitate technical changes in the sprint. If you can improve her ankle stiffness, maybe that alone will make her run faster, huh? if you can address that for a while. And there, of course, there are certain strength qualities that, that uh, you know, affect different parts of the sprint run. You know, like if you talk about a low position acceleration, we know there is pretty good transfer from a you know, maximum strength training to the first step from that position because you use your, your, your knee extensors and your gluteal muscles a lot. So there's a lot of pushing, you know, extension that doesn't happen so much in upright position. So in an upright position, Maybe, you know, maximum squatting is not so effective. We even know that by, by experience. So I'm going to talk a little, about, a, little about, a little bit about heavy resistance strength, strength training. And I say, you know, sometimes we say, what is strength? If you, now then, how do you define strength? Huh? Ability to generate force. Exactly. Right at first. You're unique. Have you heard me before? <laughs> the common sense, huh? <laughs> common sense. <laughs> That's why I ask you. <laughs> That's what you know. To, you know, if you talk about strength, you usually you know th think in terms of weightlifting or powerlifting. You know, immensely strong women, women and men in the world. But if you look at our Swedish Olympic champion in the triple jump, you know they're extreme forces. So when he plants his foot to jump 80 meters in a triple jump, the, the, the peak forces are exceeding 15 times body weight, maybe even 20 times body weight on one leg. So he is a strong athlete. Huh? So are all the gymnastics and the skaters that can jump high, and so is, uh, is uh, you know, Usain Bolt sprinting or a rugby player or a you know, basketball player is wrestling around the basket. You have to be, be strong. Huh? You have to be able to produce force. And strength training, resistance training can be so many different things. Huh? It's very, you know, if you t ask someone, do you do strength training? I said, yes, what do you do? You get 1,000 answers huh? because it can be so many different things. Huh? It can be lifting weights, it can be isometrics, it can be plyometrics, resist sprinting, jumping with loads, even vibrations, or you can use machines or throwing medicine balls, all you know, in, the, in the effort to, to, to try to improve strength. In, in certain aspects. But I'm going to talk about these three, heavy lifting, plyometrics, and a little bit about resistance printing. Now. Uh, Archibald Hill, famous Nobel Prize winner in 1924, he came up with a, hyperbol a hyperbolic model uh, you know, about producing force in relationship to velocity. And he showed very nicely on, you know, by using uh, you know, frog muscles, that the, the faster the contraction, the f harder it is to express force. Huh? So the, 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 the really high forces can be produced at a very low, low velocity. We knew that for a very long time. Huh? And uh, 
uh, Edman Leite, a Swedish uh, scientist, uh, you know, also using frog muscles, but more on a, on a cellular level, fiber level, show that uh, we are able to produce a lot of forces eccentrically. So it's not only the, the hyperbolic model, it's, a, it's a, the model goes on when it comes to eccentric strength, and at the high velocity eccentric contraction, we can produce a lot of force. And that's why people can jump for a uh, triple jumper or a high jumper, you know, but because it's a lot of, of a different kind of exercises. We see a lot, lot of this even in textbooks these days. People are talking about surfing the curve. But I think uh, Ashivar Hill would rotate in his grave if he heard this, you know. I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't. Uh, draw up uh, a force relationship relationship with different exercises is impossible. It's even difficult to do it with, with one exercise. Huh? You can do a, you can ex you can do a, like a, uh, you know, a squat or a bench press, and you can do a, a theoretical model of a force, force and velocity, but you can't mix up the exercises. It's, it can work as a model, but it doesn't work in, in real life. Uh, Spanish uh, research, he's a researcher but also a sprint coach, Pedro Jiménez Reyes, showed this very nicely, you know, that, uh, that relationship between F0, the force that can be produced at zero velocity, in relationship, you know, the, 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 the velocity that can be created at, at zero force. Huh? So what they did that they, they, they had people uh, unloaded lying on a sled, and push as hard as, as they can get, and they did opposite in, in a vertical direction. And in, in a good world, you know, you would think that the strongest athlete was also, also be the, f the fastest athlete. You have a very nice correlation. But in real life, out of, you know, more than 500 subjects, you know, from Olympic athletes to novice athletes, the, the correlation is it's no correlation. Because there are strong athletes that can, can jump, express a lot of force at, at the, at a low load and opposite. It's a mix. Not everyone is the same. Uh, in athletics, we know this very well, you know, that uh, big and strong is not necessarily fast. You don't see in a record, record breaking sumo wrestlers, you don't see in a, any, any fat people jumping 240 in the high jump. You know, they, they say it's the relative strength that really matters. You have to be, express a lot of force in relationship to your body mass. We also know that you don't necessarily have to be big to be strong and fast. In track and field, you, you see subjects that sometimes, uh, you know, they're very lean, but still very strong. Huh? I've seen Christian Olsson, you know, clean 155, 160 kilo. He looks like a stork. Huh? He looks very skinny, long-legged guy. Huh? Decent technique, but super strong. Huh? Very effective nervous system. Huh? probably very dense packed muscle fibers. And we know that maximum strong athletes are not necessarily faster sprinters, but there are highly individuals. There are some really strong people too, you know. They are in the world class, there are sprinters that have never lifted a weight, but run 99. And you have people that run 99 that can either squat 230, 240 kilos. So you have a huge range. But if you take one person, one subject, and do like a pilot study on or Mladen had decided to be a sprinter, he's going to have pretty good effect, uh, a good transfer from squatting to sprinting early on if he's never done it before. But it's usually a diminishing return. But if, and if you continue doing this uh, towards the end, there's not going to be effect at all. You're going to be able to, to lift 350% of, 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 of your body mass, uh, but you haven't had effect, and usually because you tend to get heavier. All the time. Makes you slower. <laughs> yeah, from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. After a certain point. Of certain point. Uh, but unfortunately, there's something people sometimes forget. So they, in, a, in a vanity, you're getting faster and faster, and lift more and more and more after year after year after year. Should have stopped, you know. And it's very hard to say, okay, you have to squat two times body weight. For some person, it might be enough. Huh? So another person, maybe he can benefit from the lifting 2.5 or even 3. So it's very highly individual. So you have to, it's a try and error. But it could be, it could be that we are having simplistic models, mechanical models. Yeah. Newtonian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Force equal, sorry, strength equal ability to generate force. Yeah.
Yeah. So if I able to generate more force per mass, yeah. as, as we know, that it's also the variant side of, uh, of uh, research. Yeah. Variant, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then the, 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 the stronger I am, the faster I will be because I'm able to generate more mass specific force. Yeah. But it doesn't seem to be. No, because you know, to, to produce maximum force, maybe you need a second. Huh? But in a sprinting, you have 80 to 90 millisecond to express the force. So you can probably be very, very strong with a lot of slow teeth fibers. Huh? But to express that level of force, your muscles, muscles has to be, at the, in sprinting or jumping, you have to have fast muscles as well. Huh? And, and on top of that is the elasticity, the shortening cycles, totally different, uh, different type of contractions. Huh? <laughs> it's never wrong. But one thing that is in interesting obse observation, I find, you know, when it comes to, if you take track and field, the sport I am, you know, most track and field athletes reduce uh, their weight training in May uh, to a minimum level. And the they, uh, most important competition are August and in, in September. Sometimes interesting ob observation, just by sprinting and jumping, competing in the summer, how well they can maintain their the, the, the maximum strength as well. But it m must be the, that they maintain the neural capacity. And, they, and they, they, a lot of them are very fast twitch people. Huh? So usually they don't lose any muscle mass either, you know, by not doing any weight training. Uh, this uh, grand law, you know, when it comes to, to training, is the specific adaptation on only points demand. You become good at what you're training. Huh? And if you talk about it becoming fast, we have to tick off a lot of boxes as to say some, something is really specific to sprinting. It has to be muscle specific. Uh, you have got to look at joint angles, force vectors, the magnitude of forces, uh, you know, ang angular velocity and energy amounts. It's a list is long to be truly specific to sprinting. This is a nice paper by, by Panda that came out in 2001. He, he was focusing on what muscle groups are prime movers in sprinting. That can tell us a lot. At least to be muscle specific, we, maybe we want to target those muscles extra if you want to be able to run fast or jump, you know, jump high. So this is a paper I can recommend. I think it's, it's very, and I think it's very nice conducted, and it uh, it's, uh, seems solid, at, at, at least for me. Uh, when it comes to heavy, heavy resistance training, you know, classic squatting, you know, things like that, dead bars and, and so on, you know, there's probably some advantage to, to, to sprinting and, and, and that it to lift very very highly you know you will know that the newly driving recruitment of even high threshold motor units are higher you train the whole spectrum we know that maybe the discharge rate is not as high but it's still very neural potentially lowers the threshold for, for you know for, for recruitment of, of fast motor units because they, they get become more accessible when you have never trained before you have, a, you have a large part of the pool that is not, it's not, they're not being recruited when you lift. But when you start lifting or whatever, you, you recruit more and more of, more of the very high threshold of the units and hopefully lower the thresholds. It's a good foundation for speed strength. Uh, you know, I think it's good to, to see it that way. You need a basic uh, strength to develop both, both speed strength and speed. It develops general strength and robustness. I like the Olympic lifting because they, it uh, affects a lot of big parts of, of, the, of, the, of the human body. We've we done some estimations when it comes to an Olympic snatch. If you want to replace an Olympic snatch with machines, you're going to need maybe 20 machines, huh? and you're going to train all day. But if you choose an Olympic snatch and you have decent technique, you can be in and out of the gym in 20 minutes and you used a lot of big parts of, of, the, of the muscle. Of course, it needs some technical skill, especially if you're lifting heavy. So it's another of those things which should start, I think, fairly early in your career. Huh? And uh, it's, it's probably no use you know, starting you know, you know, Olympic lifting if you're 32 and never done it before. It's gonna take five years before you have any sort of effect. Uh, in a lot of team sports, we talk about robustness, you know. 
even you know even if uh, your attacking is not allowed in, in basketball it's a lot of contact you have to be robust you have to be strong you know to, to keep the opponents away yeah? like I said whole body exercises if you want hypertrophy some skinny people want to build muscle mass heavy lifting is very effective huh? so it can be a, a good 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 uh, good uh, choice Distant watches might be that, like we, you said, uh, Mladen, that the force production times are very long, cannot be compared to sprinting. Uh, very slow mo mo moments, no stretch shortening cycle. Uh. It's difficult to combine the motor skill development. You find that all the time in periods when we lift heavy, it's very hard to sprint fast. Uh. It both is, is a longer recovery, but it also seems to disturb mechanics uh, and re ability to relax. Uh. Hypertrophy, especially on very high, you know, high fast fit subjects, they can just look at a barbell and they grow, uh, and they become heavier. So if you want, uh, you have to, you know, you want to avoid hypertrophy, you've got to make sure that very limited amount of repetitions, be a bit careful, you know, with, with, with better to have a couple of reps in the tank, uh, lift few repetitions, see it's more neural than bodybuilding. Uh. We know from studies too, under, uh, Andersen et al. group from early 2000, you have a huge transfer of, of myosin 2x two, to, two to 2a. Muscle becomes slower by, by, uh, by lifting heavy. If you rest, you get an overshoot, they are also shown. If you take disabled athletes and take a, 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 Michael, a, a biopsy of them, they only have fast fibers. Huh? All the slow fibers are almost gone, but they have no recruitment. Everything is left. So it seems like if you rest, muscle becomes faster. Uh, what about in the weight room? You know, this is one of the strongest athletes I came uh, came across. He's an ice hockey player, uh, very high level in Sweden, uh, around 30 years old. He cannot longer squat very heavy. He, he, his personal best, I think, is 240 heel in a full squat. But he has a lot of hockey players, uh, lo, big lordosis like this, tilted, tilted uh, hip, uh, always issues with his back, cannot lift super heavy. But we test him in isometrically in the, in the or leg press machine to see at around 120 degrees is an important angle for, for, for skaters. How strong is he? Huh? You know how strong he is? Huh? 850 kilo. 850 kilo he can press, express force, sitting that isometrically. Then you start to think, oh, that 250 kilo is not so impressive. <laughs> if this is his true max, then you know, he'll be able to produce force. It is interesting though, he's been training strength, resisted heavy resistance training since he was about 15 years old. If you tell him to do a counter movement jump, people think that people are strong, they can jump high. You barely see an air under his feet. Huh? He is one of the less explosive person I met. And he's been doing weight training to improve his explosiveness. Huh? So maybe he's robust and stuff, you know, but he's not very explosive. He's not a very good skater. Huh? He's a good tackler because he weighs a lot. In athletics, you know, we have a lot of pretty fragile people. Huh? They, you know, like, uh, you know, not only men, women too, they have, you know, not, not very thick boned. They're very fragile, but a lot of times they're very, very strong in the, in the thighs and in the, in, the, in the, you know, in the, in the buttocks and so on. But they usually, if we, if we let them lift too heavy, you know, it, you know, we can break them down pretty easily, you know. To, get, to create issue, you know, health issues because they, they are not really built for that. They are too strong in the lower body compared to the torso. So in athletics, it's uh, pretty common to, to choose uh, you know, unilateral exercises like step-ups and so on. I stopped doing you know, freestanding step-ups when I saw a girl in the gym that broke her leg you know, with 150 kilo on the bar, you know, you know, tripped fell with a, you know, with a bar and completely broke her tibia, you know. So severe operation, never came back as an athlete. Huh? So we try to be a bit more careful when it comes to, 
to do a, a you know, unilateral exercise like this. Bit, play it a bit more safe. There's always the risk of reward. Huh? So this might be effective, but it's a highly risky exercise. You have to have, a, have an extra high Smith machine. This is not as easy as it looks with a 25 kilo plate. To do a, a squat like that is not, this looks like a piece of cake, but go and try after and see. <laughs> this is another issue I find, you know, that maximum intention and tension that if we're going to lift uh, maximum loads, even if it's slow, for this to be neural, we have to attack it with high intensity to get that in neural drive to recruit as fast new uh, motor units. Huh? But sprinting is not so much about maximum intention and, 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 and uh, it's a lot about relaxation. And I, I have seen, you know, people that love to spend time in the weight room, a lot of times I see they're very, very tense when they sprint. Huh? They're so used to this maximum tension. Everything they do, they want to do maximum. But they don't have that effortless when it comes to running. And also people that love, you know, overemphasize bilateral squ squatting seems to become very stiff in the hip. And sprinting is very much about a rotating hip, rotating the upper body, you know, coordination between the lower and the, and the, and the upper part of, of the torso. And the people that do, you know, squatting all the time, they run like a concrete hip. And they, 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 don't, they lose, you know, centimeters every step because they can't rotate around the, around the hip. In, sprint, in, in sprinting, we usually, we have two types. Then you have the mix, too, you know. We have the boxer hound and the greyhounds. Huh? And uh, you have people that are mesomorphic and we have the ect ectomorph type, you know. For a while, in the 90s and maybe 80s, you saw a, some very muscular guys. Huh? And I think it has had a lot to do with it. was a generation, a lot of doping. Huh? But lately, you know, we've seen more and more sprinters that look more like the sprinters from the you know, 60s and the 70s. They're pretty lean, but they're breaking world records almost. They're really, really fast without you know, having excess uh, muscle mass. And sometimes you, you might you think, if we, here's a couple of guys, Peter Carlson that I trained, you know, that uh, has a national record in the 60 and the, in the 100 meter, he was super stiff. When he la landed on it, he was very, very stiff. Not so much an el elasticity as two and 200 meter run. He was more like a rubber ball. And then you have Johan Wisman, you know, that they are best 400 meter run. When he, he, he retired, we did a muscle biopsy to see, you know, the muscle fiber composition. And he says he has the national record in 200, 20.3, and he was one of the best in the world, you know, in the 400. He has 55% slow twitch, 45% uh, fast twitch, predominantly slow twitch muscles. Huh? When he was 17 years old, he could run the 10 kilometers in 37 minutes. And he, was, he didn't even go to the nationals to sprint because he was too slow. But he was super elastic. So they develop the elasticity and become faster and faster. And faster. It's not only the muscle cells, it's also the you know, other tissues that are not contracted, but they're very effective when it comes to, to pr producing speed in short time. And you know, one guy I'm coaching at the moment, he's only 17 years old. You know, he's 196, like uh, usually in Bolt, very promising sprinter. So I know I'm going to be very careful with him, at least when it comes to building muscle mass. He's very elastic, you know, it's more than you and this man. He can run, you know, even he's a good, good hurdler and sprinter. He can run a good time even in 800, 1500 meter, very elastic. So I'm, I'm, I'm treating him like a, you know, like a greyhound more than a boxer hound. But if you were to train, you know, a guy like Shaq O'Neill, you know, a huge person, you know, that uh, probably benefited from lifting alone and has got a lot of good genetics for, for putting on muscle mass. Huh? They're totally different. And like I said before, in basketball, you get a huge variety. If, if I see two different types of sprinting, you probably see 10 different types on, on, in, in basketball. 
we talked about this is a, this is a velocity trace with the laser camera we used here. You know, this is the the best sprinter we have in Sweden at the moment. He won the world, the European Championship for Juniors a couple of years back. He's run 10, 20, and 100 meters. And we're measuring him with a laser camera. We have EI mu sensors uh, in, the, in, in, the, on the, on the shoes, so we can, we can detect, you know, the contact time, flight time, you know, stride lengths, flight frequency, etc. You know, up to, to 100 meter race. Huh? And here, as I said, you know, the contact times are they're very, very low. Huh? They're not even a tenth of a second under, a, you know, under 90 millisecond, even a few steps. And the flight time is stable around 130, 30 millisecond. And this happens to be, be about the same fee numbers as Usain Bolt. But Usain Bolt's advantage is that he is 196 centimeters tall, and this guy is about 183. So the advantage of Usain Bolt are his long, long legs, huh? and he runs fast. Huh? So in, in 92 millisecond, uh, Henrik Larsson's contact length, how, how far he he moves the center of gravity on this, in the stance phase, maybe be a, around a meter, versus, you, uh, versus Bolt is covering more ground, you know, maybe 110, 110 or 115 centimeters uh, in the same time. And he can, he has more time to apply force, so his impulse, force impulse is going to be greater. So he also going to fly longer in the air. So, while, while, while uh, Henrik's stride length stabilizes around 245 to 250, Hushin Bolt's stride length is almost is over 270 centimeters. Huge, big stride. And this is a nice uh, study from Miran Co., excellent sport biomechanics. They did a study on, on, on Hushin Bolt in 2011 in Zagreb. He ran a race in 985, and the measure the distance from the ground up to center of mass. Huh? And this is the, the left leg, this is the, the right leg. TD means touchdown. You know, what's the distance from the ground to center of gravity, a touchdown. A rotation phase is the lowest position. This is toe off, this is the highest position. So with the left leg, 111.76 centimeter. And at the lowest, lowest point is 111.62. So it doesn't even sink one centimeter with the left leg. And the right leg, he happens to sink one centimeter. So he's super stiff. He doesn't go very much up and down. No? If you compare that to a recreational runner, when they plant the ground, they collapse. They collapse around the ankle, the knee, and the hip. So the center of gravity moves up or down like this. And in track and field sprinting and other sports too, you see people with huge quads, but they don't have the stiffness around the ankle. And if you don't have the stiffness around the ankle, you're losing a lot of energy. You're just landing soft. You don't produce a lot of force. You need that stiffness, you know, to be stiff, attack the ground, land stiff, and produce force. Uh, you know, we know that high intensity training, it, it does increase tendon stiffness. A lot of jumping, a lot of sprinting, and the system becomes stiffer and stiffer. And the tendons is, very, 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 is a very nice piece of tissue. I don't think any engineer, any engineer could, could develop it. A tendon is very elastic on the muscle side, but it's very stiff on the, on the bone side. And we know that it, like the Achilles tendon, it can stretch up to eight to 10%. So you can really elongate. It's like a very stiff rubber band. And the more climatics and sprinting and stuff you do, the stiffer it gets. But if it gets too stiff, the muscle is gonna suffer. It's gonna be too stiff for the, for the health of the muscle. So usually when you get my mus muscle issues and, and, and you, you, you rupture the muscle because the tendons are too stiff from too much high intensity training. So I think it's really, really important to, to work with more sustained contractions, slower contraction, isometrically. And I think that's very important even, in, even, for, even for basketball. You play in hard court, you know, you spend hours of weeks, you, you have the chance to develop this stiffness 
But to maintain a healthy body, I think you need those sustained concussions too. You know, slow, heavy calf raises, both standing, but also, like I say, the hidden gem, the soleus, is really, really important. It's very slow twitch, but it has a, a lot of elasticity with, 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 within the muscle. So, and that trains best with a flexed knee, as you, as you all know. And this is how it looks. It looks like, if you look at it first, it looks like this guy is a world record holder in the 400 meter, Van Niekerk. It looks like he's bouncing. But then you look at his head, he's very still. So what he's, he's doing is working, you know, very elastic. You know, he, he, they load elasticity in, you know, a touchdown and they get the rebound in the propulsive phase without going much up and up because they're very, very stiff. There's always the debate what is more important, is the vertical forces or are the horizontal forces? If you're going to move forward, we know according to Newton's law, you have to produce horizontal force in acceleration. But when you come up to maximum velocity, the, you know, the, you all, all, all you have to do to maintain force is to, to produce more force than the, the wind is, is against you. So the, the, net impulse does, is not as great as in acceleration when you, when you have to produce uh, you know, a lot of horizontal force. So in, in, the, in the acceleration, of course, the horizontal force uh, is going to be more important than the vertical. At the vertical component, you're more aware of withstanding your body mass. Huh? But the, the faster you go, the is more, go, more and more vertical forces is, uh, is uh, involved. But, like I say, you know, it's, it's no use debating this, you know, because I think like, like vertical and horizontal force components is a, it's a symphony of both. Huh? And, and like I, I like to see it that when we want to run fast, you have to attack the ground, you have to store and release elastic energy, and you have a very powerful hip extensor that drives the spring. It's no coincidence that all fast humans, both men and women, have very well developed glutes and hamstrings, and the ability to produce horizontal force in the, in the stance phase, both in acceleration but at, and also in, in the, in, in the top, top field space. So if elasticity is important, stiffness is important, you might, you might want to look a little bit into climetrics. Huh? There's also a, a, thing, a thing that a lot of people have opinion about. If you see sprinters, it's an elastic guy, yeah? very high RSI. And he pre in a jump like that, he can produce, he can jump maybe in a rebound like that, he can jump maybe 65, 70 centimeter with the arms. And the force production time on the ground is about 130 to 140 milliseconds, yeah? vertically, up and down. If you take a long jumper, the takeoff. This guy comes in with 11 meters per second. He jumps, uh, you know, 7, 7, 7 50 or 8 meters. His production time is almost the same. Huh? But his, and his, and his contact time is almost the same. So 130 to 140, 130 to 140. But he produces it more or less vertically. There's no displacement of the, of the center of mass. Versus a long jumper, he hits ground here, and he moves the body here. So his contact length might be 130, 140 centimeter. And he's doing that in 130 milliseconds because the velocity is higher. The horizontal velocity is much higher. So you can't say, OK, in jumping, we, you know, for, tri for a triple jumper or long jumper, because of the takeoff time is 130 milliseconds, we need to find other exercises that can resemble that force production time. Totally different, because the force are executed in, in, in totally different ways. I like uh, exercises like this, where there's a lot of horizontal components involved. You can you see the hip thrust, huh? every step. I also like a little bit low amplitude, like spr sprint bounding very horizontal jumping. They're totally different from the vertical jumping. Uh, 
I think uh, jumping is very effective, but you have to be careful. Huh? You have to start, I think, with the concentric only jumps. Your training gear, or if you're starting jumping, you know, jumping upstairs, stuff like that, is almost no impact forces. It's very safe. Uh, we, then we do a lot of uh, low amplitude jumping, like jump coordination, learn how, you know, not a lot of impact forces, usually done on, on soft surface. Low intensity bounding and hopping, uh, running with skipping ropes, stuff like that. Can even put on a weighted vest or something and do plyometrics. You can do technical drills with a weight vest to you know, increase the load a little bit. Can just use your fantasy. Huh? And I tell people, don't jump, bounce. Have that feeling when you do plyometrics, especially that kind of a, of a, this is probably intense to jump like that. Sometimes you see, of course, an Instagram thing like this, it's incredible, huh? He's jumping from two meters. I, I don't even dare to guess what kind of impact forces he has, you know. But... He's already yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we tend to overdo, you know. If you think a plyometric is good for, for, for sprinting, it's good for... We overdo things, huh? I, my generation of triple jumpers in, in Sweden, they were very influenced about, you know, the you know, shock method, the drop jumps and stuff. So they, they drop from super high heights. Huh? And they all walk around, with new, uh, either they have new hips or they walk around like this. Huh? Because they all damage the body. We're going to go, we're going to do too much, huh? too much. And sometimes you have to draw a line. What is cost-benefit? This is Karsten Warholm, always jumping on soft surface. The best hurdler in the world, always on soft surface. Maybe not as effective as jumping on concrete, but safe enough to run the world record in four meter hurdles. And barefoot. That's a good way of developing feet strength because it's not only the plantar flexors, it's the intrinsic muscle of the feet is very, very important too, you know, for the, for the, the shock, of, uh, work of good shock absorbers. Huh? So, I think there's a lot more advantages with, with plyometrics than maximum strength in terms of, of transferring to sprinting. There's a lot of those boxes to be ticked off. There is a few things, you know, it's technical demanding. If you recruit a new player, never jumped before, he's 27 years old, I would be very careful. I could, you know, you could do the low impact jumping, you could jump upstairs, you could rip, you know, you know rope skipping, stuff. be careful, be very, very careful, especially if you're on the heavy side. There can be long recovery, like in all, all eccentric training, uh, there is long recovery. This is damaging to, to, the, to the tissue. And it's very high stress on bone and bones and tendons, especially if you overdo it. Plyometrics in basketball, I mean, it's a jumping sport, so you do, some, especially, uh, some positions do jump a lot, and you see some rather impressive uh, jumping ability. I mean, you get a few centers at 215 that never jump because you can just stand on the heels to, <laughs> to, to, to get a rebound, but you see, uh, like Charles, my, my, my son-in-law, you know, he's, he's a point guard and he's doing a lot of layups and he can jump really, really well and he's very athletic and he uses that, you know, so to his ability. He doesn't just use, shoot three-pointers. He's a good passer, but he's also a very good jumper and it's nice to see, you know, the, how the, well he reads the game and you know, when he's do, doing his layup, he can, you know, see the, the way, way to go. He's fast, he's athletic and he sometimes scores a lot of points. Uh, plyometrics will probably improve acceleration with the without ball. I think so. I guess that's my guess. Will probably improve uh, the, the accelerations and also change of direction. Change of direction is very eccentric. It resembles plyometrics a lot in, you know, the, in, in different, different ways. 
And we probably lessen the risk of injuries too. I think it uh, can also create a certain robustness that may be more specific than, than, than you know, the, the gym. But be careful is my message, especially with a little heavier, unexperienced, or at least has issues with jumping technique. But uh, we, have to, we have to be careful, we have to monitor it very carefully. And like I said, just like in, just like in, in he heavy strength, it's a diminishing return when it comes to jumping too. If you can run 10, 20 and jump 55 centimeters, you're not gonna run 10, zero just because you're gonna increase your 70. And at a certain point, you don't see any, any more transfer, just like in lifting. So you have to, to be a bit careful. Uh, Alnes and I did a biomechanical study, 1994 in Finland, it was called a Nike Scientific 60 meter because we got uh, $10,000 from Nike to, to give us prize money to the subjects that participated. There were sprinters from 10 0 to 11 0, th 30 male sprinters, so you wanted to see if there was correlation between jumping ability and sprinting ability, like Bosco told us, you know. He said that. Uh, there's more, a higher correlation between a squat jump and acceleration uh, and in the, in the maximum velocity, a higher correlation with rebound jumping and, you know, and, and uh, but we found no correlation. So we've got to be depressed, you know, it was a, my dear Professor Lime here, but the subjects he had, you know, were low level athletes, this was top at it, most of them. But then it struck my mind that we had a group of Finnish sprinters, you know, at the time, now they're pretty decent, some of them, but they, they could jump very high. Huh? They were influenced by the research in Finland. Bosco was a docent at University University. Him and Kome Hecken did lots of, of studies on, on this kind of jumping. So they were training to jump, huh? and they forgot to sprint. So if we excluded the Finnish group, we saw pretty good correlation, actually, between sprinting ability and rebound jumping. But we had the odd guy that never jumped before. Uh, you know, some Nigerian guy that never done any plane They were still run 10 zero. Uh, but uh, in general, Hank Reino says, uh, and I, I agree, uh, jumps is for cats, not for cows. So it's not for everyone. But I think basketball is not for everyone either. <laughs> you, you, you see a lot of people with elasticity. You know? You see a lot of basketball players, they really touch the ground with the heels. Huh? They walk like this. Huh? They walk like this normal when they move around. Huh? You don't see any people walking around with flat feet that are good basketball players. When it, in terms of organizing training, uh, we usually use a sandwich method. Huh? We usually do you know, horizontal plyometrics. It's a very good preparation for lifting heavy, excites the nervous system. Uh, you know, you know, could be coordinated jumps, but because it can be more intensive, we do a bit of lifting and we come out and regain some of the elasticity that we lost in the gym. Huh? So combination of plan metrics and lifting in the same session, I found is, is rather effective. Huh? It's a method we, we use for, for a long time. And for us, uh, a gym session, even on an elite level, usually doesn't take more than an, a 60 minutes, maybe 90. Usually when it comes to heavy lifting, we use two, three, you know, major exercises, uh, you know, but uh, and mix that with, 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 with other exercises. Last uh, thing is uh, when it comes to resistance sprinting, I think that resistance sprinting is probably one of the few training methods that is specific to sprinting even though that the velocity is slightly, slightly lower. But we know that we can, we can uh, emphasize on this, you know, the magnitude of force. If you put the athletes on resistance, it's gonna slow them down slightly, but uh, resistance sprinting can also be used to work on the different phases of, of, the, of a sprint. There's a lot of people that think that really heavy sleds is important. They're spending time pushing these prowlers, and the velocity maybe is one meter per second, or even slower. I say, I, I would rather go into the gym than pushing around those prowlers with your ass up on your flat feet, and it looks, I don't know, for me it just looks idiotic. Huh? 
But uh, there are some people using it with good results, so I'm, I'm probably wrong. <laughs> uh, because the climate reasons, we don't have, we can only do, when we want to imp uh, improve, I think uh, uh, hill sprints is really good to work with acceleration in the same way, huh? in a safe way. And uh, because, you know, the, the velocity is, is, is slower, you have to produce more horizontal force. The flight phases are shorter and you can maintain the so same velocity for a long period of time uh, accelerating up a hill. But we have winter, you know, from November till April. Right? So, you know, in the, in the 80s and the 90s, we, we, we started uh, producing several machines, you know, for resistance sprinting with different uh, means. And at the end of the night, we even got a motor that we connected with an encoder so we could not only run resisted and assisted, but we could also measure the velocity. Uh, now, 20 years later, there are two types of machines. There's a 1080 sprint, it's a Swedish system. So a Norwegian system called Dynaspeed that we use. Uh, that you can resist the athlete. You can resist or you can, you can assist the sprinter. So. And I see them, this is not only a, a way of, of producing four. We work we mainly as a technical tool. If you break, like Tom here, really heavy, you know, with a, with a resistance that is equivalent to about 32% of his body weight, the maximum speed he can achieve is about five meters per second. Five meters per second is equivalent to his second step. So he can make work on his first and second step for maybe 20, 30 meters, technically. Produce the same force, same velocity. And I say that is pretty specific in terms of, of the initial acceleration. And we can work ourselves up through the speed curve. At diff you can work at different phases. Uh, if you use IMU sensor or contact grids, we can get a lot of more information it's about contact time and flight times, contact lengths, and so on. And this is all the, of all the athletes, more, not all, but a lot of the team athletes we use, uh, we train and, and, and give advice to down at the high performance test. That, you know, usually we get a new team, there's a new players, we test them to have a base level. Because if they get injured, we can compare to base level. So for, for usually when the, when the our physios say, okay, now they are ready to play, a, a lot of the time I find it's guesswork. And, and they, you know, the, the coach asks, is the, ready, is, is, is the athlete ready to play? I think we need more information. You know? I, I think this is probably, it's not the only solution, but it's, it's a solution that we have been using. We use a lot of resisted to normal sprinting, do you know, like a contrast training, do resistance and then normal running. We do resisted and assisted. So resisted and assisted, also very effective for in initial acceleration. That contrasts like, like the, the, the nervous system seems to like. Which is the best training model for, for sprint development? I think we all like the dynamic correspondence model by Varsiansky, of course, but the best is to know why, when, and how to use a certain model. Most training, training, training systems are good, and sometimes it varies from, from you know, if, if you're elite or if you're a novice, you know, when you're going to do it. And uh, just to, to end up my, my little speech with this, you know, in 2004, I w we, were in, in, we went to uh, the Olympic Museum in, in uh, Olympia. It's not in Athens, but in Olympia, more on the, on the west coast. And uh, the Olympic uh, Games in, uh, in Greece was held for 1,000 years. Huh? 1,000 years that professional athletes, professional coaches, it was so important they even took a pause uh, of the games, of, of the war to, to, to host the games. Huh? That's how important it was. There is no result list in the left. We don't know. Long jumping was important. You know, a stadium sprint was important, 190 meters. There was, you know, they always got a statue if you could re win that. But uh, Eleiko, a Swedish manufacturer, had to start producing weight, you know, barbells. So that was, weightlifting was not a part of the, of the games. But humans have always liked to test strength. And in the museum, 
there was a st sandstone that got my attention in a corner with the engraving said that Bibon Sona Pula has lifted me overhead and it's 600 years old huh? and it weighs 150 kilos. And if you compare that to strongman competition today, you know, there's Atlas, the only biggest one, they, they roll up on a, on a platform, they weigh about 165. Huh? So maybe now, 1,000 or 1,500 years later, maybe we are not more, better than them. We don't know. If we do something for 1,000 years, huh? be professionalism for 1,000 years, uh, you're going to figure out what to do. Huh? And, so, and uh, we have been doing professional sport for 50 years. Huh? But I think personally that uh, the use of performance enhancing drugs has really hampered development of sport. Huh? Because people are, you know, they still develop if they get their pills and a shot in the ass. Huh? But like a guy like Karsten Warholm, you know, the Norwegian hurdler, you know, he's been such a relief for me to show what you can do huh? with good training, huh? dedicated coaches, you know, you can break world records in any, any, any discipline. Huh? So I think we're still in the dark ages. Huh? There's still so many things that we, we can develop. And one of the most thing, thing we, I think personally we have to even work hard is communication with athletes. At least, I don't know about in Hungary, but in Swedish, the coaching education system is not a lot about uh, you know, psychology and communication. It's a lot about uh, physiology, biomechanics, training, planning, and so on. But this is what really matters. Huh? To be able to communicate with athletes is, uh, when it's a, it's a key factor that sometimes uh, we forget. So one hour and 20 minutes goes faster. So we have 10 minutes to questions or comments or uh, don't feel free to criticize me. I, I, I think feedback is the best thing you can get. If you have negative or positive feedback, if you have good intentions, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an honor to take. So anything, just uh, shoot. Which kind of heavy resistance rate training do you prefer the most? Uh, uh, Olympic lifting and the derivates. Uh. If, and I think you should start early. Uh. I think you should start when you're you know, around puberty. And that's just for technique. Uh. Then it's much easier when you're 20. And mostly because of you save time. Uh. You're in and out of the gym quick. I don't want to you know, train there. But I also think it's around. Something I neglected for many years was isometric training. Huh? I think it's very important for health. For, for a long time, we were very focused on high intensity. You know, everything we did was high intensity. But I think you need to do that little bit of bodybuilding, isometric for health. And uh, that goes for all athletes. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm sure you need it in, in basketball too, you know. Yeah, according uh, to that, what should be your recommendation for us as a basketball? In, ter in terms of, yeah. I mean, then you probably have to, you know, when it comes to, you know, reha re rehabilitation and recovery, probably e isolated uh, is probably better to work in machines. Huh? Uh, I think it's better than the free weights. So. Okay. And as a last one, uh, which type of athlete do you prefer to train more? So, I, I like I, I like th to train the athletes, not not necessarily that are super talented, but the ones that are very devoted. Huh? And, uh, you know, I, I really like the ones that I can have a good communication with and, you know, develop a good relationship with, you know, that I really enjoy. And, uh, you know, I've been training, you know, when I tr we're talking about team sports, I've been training some professional athletes in the summer times, you know, uh, you know, NHL players and so on, very good athletes, but uh, small groups. But usually the guy, these are the guys that are very devoted, huh? They like to do that extra thing. Even if they stop, the season stops in the beginning of June, and they're supposed to be back in America in the middle of August, they won't use the summer months to in invest in their own physique because they know how important it is. And a lot of these guys, we have, we have a communication all year round. Huh? So the ideal is if you can have a combination with them, but also on the coaches in America, 
So what, what, what they do is in, in you know, symmetry of what, what they've been doing in the summer. But uh, I like people that are really devoted and uh, not only talented. And I think the, I can really enjoy a mediocre talent, you know, to surprise you with a good result, despite he has the wrong parents. Huh? <laughs> we, we always have that loop, loop to, 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 to blame. Huh? Our parents were not talented enough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is only a thought, and I yeah. uh, just your opinion on it. So we talked about how the strength training is uh, is helping until one point, and my thought is, uh, what if we are oriented too much on developing our potential, yeah. and not the transfer to yeah. the actual sport? Yeah. So you said that in a Finnish uh, organization before, it was thought that, that the vertical jump is uh, it will. It's, it's cor correlating with yeah, the sprint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they practice it that to way. To jump higher. Yeah, to jump yeah, higher, yeah, yeah. thinking that they will sprint yeah. faster, but maybe they weren't sprinting. Yeah. So they forgot how to do it. Yeah. So there is actual correlation, but you need to keep doing. Your event at the same time. What yeah, are yeah, you yeah, doing? Yeah, 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 so yeah, what yeah. if we are like uh, professionals, too much focused on the developing the potential yeah. instead of uh, developing the ways to transfer that potential into the actual sports. I, I think, you know, yeah, general preparation is sometimes lost. Huh? I think it's, that's really, really important as well, you know, that sometimes we get lost in that, you know. That uh, I think uh, that, you know, if, if you look, look at your young kids nowadays, they, they don't play anymore. Huh? They sit and they play computer games and they came, come and play basketball and they specialize when they're 12, 13 years old. Mm -hmm. If you tell them, can you stand on your heads? They cannot stand on their hands. They, can't, they don't have any gymnastic ability because at least in our country, it's gone from schools. Huh? They play football and they dance. So no one is doing gymnastics. No one is doing this general training that's really important to, for a long career, a healthy body. You know? So we have to... You have to treat, you know, 12, 13 years old to totally the beginners. Huh? You have to train them that we used to train maybe seven years old. So we don't take anything for granted. And we have a great issue in Sweden with, with young athletes getting hurt and getting dramatically increased. And I think for us to, because at the moment now we have 30 indoor halls in, in the nation. We have invested a lot of money into indoor halls for athletics. Huh? So they, mean, they, they spend eight months of the year indoor on hard surface. Huh? They're barely outside. Huh? So they move from hard surface inside to hard surface outside, and no one is in the woods anymore. You know, we're running on soft surface, and you know, so we have to be, be, be I think we have to do a better job. Huh? We can't accept that kids that are 15 get the stress fractures. Huh? It's uh, no, no good. Huh? And, when be, 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 like I said, been to Jamaica a couple of times, you know, they, they don't know what stress factor is. Huh? They train on grass. They train on grass from October till, till March, only on grass. It's not really great for stiffness, and it's not really great for, you know, stretch shortening, but probably develop strength. You have to produce strength in another mean. Uh, so, uh, so I think we have to really think about the surface we are playing sports on. And uh, like I said, you don't have to do this idiotic line metrics, you know, yes, because you can do it, huh? it's probably not going to make you a better basketball player. You're just taking a great chance of getting injured. Huh? That's at least how I see it. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have any online questions from the online audience? No? So no questions? Everything is understandable? So anyway, I want to, first of all, I want to thank Hokan for coming over and helping us with the, with the projects we are having here with the uh, speed testing. Also for a great presentation. It's, it's going to make us uh, rethink and reconsider some stuff. Um, and uh, I want to thank you for uh, participating in the lecture. And uh, see you soon in the future educational projects we're going to have here. Thanks Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.